The island of St. Helena is located in the South Atlantic Ocean between Ascension Island and Tristan da Cunha. The nearest mainland is Namibia, about 1,200 miles to the east. As the airport is not yet complete, the only way to get to the island is by travelling on the mail ship RMS St. Helena. The RMS St. Helena is one of only two ocean-going vessels in the world, still to carry the privileged title of Royal Mail Ship, held in the past by so many famous British passenger liners. She leaves Cape Town about every six weeks in order to supply the islands of St Helena and Ascension. The journey to St Helena takes five days. After a two-day stop in St Helena, the ship carries on to Ascension. This gives the visitor eight days to explore the island. The RMS St Helena loads up at Cape Town and with the help of tugs gets on its way. Soon Cape Town with its magnificent view of Table Mountain disappears in the distance and we prepare for our five-day voyage on board this working ship carrying goods and people nearly halfway across the ocean. The bow of the ship is laden with containers of goods leaving the stern and decks for the visitors. Captain sets his course at 309 degrees and settles down to a calm crossing. Early in the morning of the fifth day, we get our first glance at the island of St Helena. A 47 square mile island, it is one of the remotest settled islands in the world, being only 10.5 miles long and 6.5 miles wide. It is a subtropical paradise with spectacular contrasts. Clearly, the island has had a very active volcanic history. There is no natural harbour in St Helena. Rupert's Bay and Jamestown come into view and we moor just off Jamestown in the deep water. The island's remote location meant it was used as a place of exile for key prisoners and also played an important role during the abolition of slavery. It is soon time to take the lighter to the customs hall on the island in Jamestown. St Helena touches many aspects of world history. Discovered by the Portuguese in 1502, it became a Dutch, then a British possession, initially under the East India Company, then the Crown. It was a strategically important port of call during the British Empire. One feature you notice as soon as you land is Jacob's Ladder. This huge set of steps was built in 1829 for the St Helena Railway Company to bring provisions from the town to the garrison at the top of the hill. The 699 steps average 11 inches rise per step. The ladder is 600 feet high. It takes the average person about 20 minutes to climb the steps and about 10 minutes to come down. The school children can be seen using this ladder daily. The town is very quiet today but our flat gives us a good view of the post office and shops. Jamestown has the atmosphere of a small English country village. It has a tightly packed row of colourfully painted houses on both sides of Grand Parade and Main Street. From the top of the hill, Jamestown can be seen to be squeezed into the bottom of the valley. 
Rupert's Bay where all the power for the island is generated. This bay is now being used to land materials for the new airport and whilst it won't quite be a harbour, approval has been given for a wharf for Rupert's Bay. At Flagstaff Hill, at 2,257 feet, you get a fabulous view of the coastline. The top of the hill is very windy and only small plants grow there. Indigenous to St Helena were six unique land birds. Only one survives today. It is a small plover called a wirebird because of its thin legs. Only about 200 adults remain. From Flagstaff Hill we move to Prosperous Bay Plain where the new airport is being built. It is feared that the airport will have an impact on the wirebird that lives here. At Prosperous Bay Plain we visit the Bell Stone. This piece of tracheandesite is somehow hollow and rings when hit. Next is Sandy Bay with interesting geological features as well as buildings of historical interest. The higher ground is lush but the lower ground is barren. The black volcanic sand is evident on the beach. Along this route, an outcrop called Lot's Wife is very prominent. Moving from Sandy Bay, the Diana's Peak National Park is a testament to the island's pristine environment and home to most of St Helena's endemic wildlife. It has 60 known native species of plant. 45 occur nowhere else, including the white ebony flower. On St Helena, three properties are under the administration of the French Foreign Ministry. These consist of Longwood House, the small pavilion Briars and Valley of the Tomb. Here is Briars Pavilion. When Napoleon was incarcerated in St Helena in 1815 after Waterloo, he first stayed at the Briars until Longwood House was ready. Longwood House is much larger than the Briars and Napoleon stayed here until his death in 1821. There are large gardens around the house where Napoleon was permitted to stroll. About 20 loyal French soldiers stayed with him at Longwood. Longwood we moved to Napoleon's tomb. Napoleon was buried here in 1821 but was exhumed in 1840 and his remains taken to Les Invalides in Paris. To Plantation House, the residence of the island's governor, as well as that of Jonathan, the world's oldest living animal.
a giant tortoise who is around 180 years old. To Jamestown, a traditional march by the local scouts and guides. Soon it is time to leave and we take the lighter back to the ship. Lifeboat drill is soon completed and we move off southeast back towards Cape Town and the end of our visit to St Helena. St Helena offers many things to see, from visiting the Georgian town, Jamestown, to the rugged coastline, from the rolling hills to the stark yet striking geology at Sandy Bay. St Helena's natural beauty and historic heritage are in turn stunning and dramatic. Breathtaking views from the highest peaks, inviting waters and 100% quaintness, offering all visitors an extraordinary lifetime experience. In spite of its small size, the island has a huge amount to offer in terms of outstanding scenery, pristine marine waters, subtropical conditions and warm and friendly people, a true discovery.